believe that we're living in the end times? Yes, yes? okay, I expected that answer. And but a follow-up question. Do you believe that Jesus will return in your lifetime? Yes. Yeah, you do? Got some yeses? I've certainly felt that in my, in my life a few times. If you want to do hands? Who thinks you just might come back in their lifetime? Okay. Uh, here is the predicament. If we're going to be alive, be so in one of two groups. What are those two groups? Sorry? What are the two groups? That's not what I was looking for, but that is the right answer. Two groups. We have those uh, majority of the unsaved, the lost, the wicked, or we have the saved, the special small group of the saved. Uh, because there's only, of course, two sides in the great controversy. So uh, you have to decide. You have to be either on one side or the other. Today, has everybody decided today? Do we have only two groups today? No. We have three groups, maybe more. So there is one group that still hasn't decided. They uh, maybe haven't heard the message, the good news, they are indifferent, um, that they haven't been pushed to the point of having to make a decision or for whatever reason. So we have some work to do because eventually everybody has to decide. So today I want to spend some time talking about this special group of the say, which is going to be the last um, uh, people uh, on earth when Jesus comes back. We want to look at what makes them special and what does it take to be among them. We can read about it in Revelation chapter 14, uh, verse 1 and 5, I believe I'm reading, it's 1, 2, 5, but I've shortened it. Then I looked and behold, so this is just before the three angels' messages is given in Revelation. Then I looked and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 having his father's name written on their foreheads. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. And the Spirit of Prophecy adds the following words. These, having been translated from earth, from among the living, are counted as first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. These are they which come out of the great tribulation, they have passed through the time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation. So the first thing we need to understand is, if you think or if you want to be alive when Jesus comes, you can only do so by being in a special group represented by the 144,000. These are the last remaining people alive on earth that go through the time of trouble. So who is this group and where do they come from? We can read about it a little bit more in this, another passage that talks about it in Revelation 7, and I'll be reading just verse 4 and 5. Let's see where these guys come from. Um, it says there, I think about verse 4, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. Of the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 were sealed. And so on and so on. 12,000 for every tribe. So where did they come from, the 144,000? Why did we just read? 12 tribes. 12 tribes of Israel. Okay, what were the, the 12 tribes of Israel come from the 12 sons of Israel or Jacob? What were the sons of Jacob like? Were they good people? Some of them. Some of them? But some of them started off pretty bad, right? They were sinners. Do you remember some of the things that they did? They tried to sell Joseph into slavery, that they wanted to kill him. What else did they do? Some of the, sto some of the stories we have later on, they killed people, they slaughtered the whole town, they deceived the town. What else did they do? Do you remember? One of them, they were sick, well, I don't know if it's one, but they slept with harlots, uh, all sorts of things that they did. But what happened to them? They started off as great sinners, but that they transformed their character throughout their life, uh, and in the end, they became really good. Even to the point where Judah wanted to offer himself as a sacrifice for his brother. So they had a transformation of character. Um, so will the 144,000 be literal Jewish virgin men from the state of Israel, do you think? No, it's probably not the case. So what we're looking at here is a symbol. 
The 144,000 as a symbol represent God's people on earth. Uh, we know that everything in the Old Testament was literal Israel. In the New Testament, it is spiritual Israel, God's people on earth. Um, and shall we go any deeper into who the 144,000 are? No. Because the Spirit of Prophecy tells us that it is not His will that they should go into controversy over questions which will not help them spiritually, such as who is to compose the 144,000. But look at this statement. Those who are the elect of God will in short time know without question. So if you are the 144,000, if you are God's elect in the end times, you will know. God will reveal it to you in short time. All right, so the next question then is, how many are there in the 144,000? Is this number real or symbolic? What do you think? Someone says real? Does anybody think it's symbolic? Okay, literal or symbolic? You didn't answer me. You guys are very quiet this morning. I like to ask questions. Literal, nobody thinks symbolic, good. Uh, I think it's literal as well. Uh, and here are some reasons why I think it's literal. In Revelation, we have a, a, a lot of symbols. It's a whole book of symbols and prophecy. We have the lamb, which is not really a lamb. We have a dragon, uh, which is not really a dragon. We have horns, we have beasts, we have all sorts of symbols like that. However, the numbers are not symbolic usually, they're literal. So when it says you have ten horns, it actually represents ten kingdoms. If it says you have two beasts, it is actually two beasts, the earth beast and the sea beast, and uh, 24 elders, and so on. Even time-based prophecy, while it is God's time, a day for a year, it is a specific number, 12,600 days, 1,260 days. It is that many days or years, so it's not symbolic. The other reason why I think it's a literal number is because after the 144,000 were given and told about the great multitude. Now, the great multitude is not a specific number. It is unbounded. It is no one can count it. So, the 145,000 is a very precise number. Also, Jesus. How many disciples did he choose? Twelve. Was it very important where they come from? Which tribes? No. Was it important that the number stays twelve? Yes, because they replaced the one that left with another one. So the number 12 is a precise number. Now this number might look very small. Can you imagine only 144,000 uh, of God's people saved on earth? But if you think about history, there's only ever been two people that have been translated to heaven. So this is a very special group of 144,000 of God's followers. And now we're going to take a little bit of a breather and look at some other special and rare things. This is a white peacock. It is pretty rare. Um, it's missing the color pigments. Um, it looks very beautiful. This is a bismuth crystal. Uh, again, they have amazing colors and the structure looks like something from a sci-fi movie. It is very rare. This is very interesting as well. It's called Life Within Death. It is actually a Chinese lantern. So this thing grows like that, and then it dries away on the outside, but the inside is still a fruit. Very interesting. Very unique and very rare. Flying fish, also very you know, rare and unique and very interesting. So usually, when things are rare, they are more valuable. Uh, they are special. They are more beautiful. Maybe they have a higher quality. So let's figure out the maths here and figure out how rare the 144,000 really are. Um, 144,000 is a complete number. Um, we can do all sorts of cool math things where we can say 144,000 is 12,000 times 12,000 times uh, 1,000, which is 10 to the power of 3. And then we can say, oh, look, you know, it's God, number 3, uh, you know, with the 10 commandments and the 12 apostles and the 12 tribes. Very cool. But we're not going to do that. Um, what we are going to do is look at it in terms of the population size. So 144,000 in some 7 billion people in the world today is only 0.002%. And because I already gave it away there, it is 1 in 50,000 people. So, to give you an idea how special and how small this group is, think about the 
stadium, Etihad Stadium in Docklands, it seats about 50,000 people. So imagine full pack Etihad Stadium and you are the one person in the middle of it. That is the ratio of the 144,000. Well, let me put it to you another way. In Melbourne, what's the population? Does anyone know? About 4 million people. Maybe there's about 80 people here today. 80 people in all of Melbourne being saved. Can you imagine just this congregation being in a cave somewhere, being saved, everybody else um, will not be saved. That is the number and the special group that the Bible talks about. And uh, the spirit of prophecy here confirms for us some of these statements, and these are very solemn, so I ask you to listen carefully. It is a solemn statement that I make to the church that not one in 20 whose names are registered upon the church books are prepared to close their earthly history and would be as verily without God and without hope in the world as the common sinner. They are professedly serving God, but they are more earnestly serving mammon, which is money. This half-half work, half and half work is a constant denying of Christ rather than a confession of Christ. Wow. And in another place, she takes it even further. Not one in a hundred, not one in a hundred among us is doing anything beyond engaging in common worldly enterprises. We are not half awake to the worth of the souls for whom Christ has died. Not one in a hundred of those who claim to be, believe the truth for this time are keeping the commandments to love one another. If we take, for example, the population of uh, uh, the membership of the Seventh-day Adventist Church who are living in these times, let's suppose, 20 million people, one in a hundred of 20 million is about 200,000. So you can see we're getting very close to that number of 144,000 and, and these numbers were, were, are quite dated now because it was the time of Alan G. White. So 144,000, it very quickly becomes a very realistic number. But hang on a minute. Are we really saying that only 144,000 are going to be saved? What happens to everyone else? What happens to everyone else? Die in Christ. It will die. die in Christ. Is it possible? There's some two billion Christians in the world today. Are they all either going to die or be lost? Brothers and sisters, if you read the Bible, which says that the 144,000 is going to remain alive, there is only one logical conclusion, and that is that the rest of the people are either going to die or be in the loss. So the second thing we need to understand. And that is, if you do not remain alive with the 144,000 until Jesus returns, you will have to die for Jesus, or, with, or in Jesus between now and then, or else, or otherwise, you will be among the lost. Does it seem very harsh that many people will die? Not if we consider the state of the world at the moment. There is wars brewing all over the place. And I'm sad to report to you, in my reading of the prophecies, there are many apocalyptic visions that prophesy mass casualties. Um, here's just one example from Zechariah. Um, in some ways, this has already begun, because if you look at the poverty in the third world, which we've already talked about, it's already killing billions of people. But in Zechariah 13, it says like this, And it shall come to pass in all the land, says the Lord, that two-thirds in it shall be cut off and die but one third shall be left in it. I will bring the one third to the fire, will refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name, and I will answer them, and I will say, this is my people. And each one will say, the Lord is my God. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming. How much is two thirds of seven billion? Around four billion people. Seems like a lot of people to die. But we know that Jesus has said in Matthew as well that before the time of trouble comes there will be nations that will rise against the nation. The wars will start. There will be a little time of trouble. There will be persecution. See here in uh, Spirit of Prophecy tells us very plainly. It is impossible to give any idea of the experience of the people of God who shall be alive 
upon the earth when the celestial glory and the repetitions of the persecutions of the past are blended. Many will be laid away to sleep before the fiery ordeal of the time of trouble shall come upon our world. Now you see why I was talking about the lesson this morning. It got that fact really into our heads. Many will be laid away and the repetition of persecution will come on this world. She even continues to say, The Lord has often, often instructed me that many little ones are to be laid away before the time of trouble. We shall see our children again. We shall meet them and know them in the heavenly courts. Is this a little bit familiar to you? Many people, and I don't want to focus on it anymore, but many people dying before the promised land. Is there something there familiar? Noah? Noah? Not quite. Israel. Who had to die in the desert before entering the promised land? Moses and Israel, the whole generation. But why did they have to die before entering the promised land? They didn't have faith that they can overcome the enemy. They didn't have faith that they can have victory. They, the enemy seemed too difficult for them to overcome. And they didn't want to put an effort to try. And when they did put in an effort, they did it on their own power. Why couldn't Moses enter in, into the promised land? One sin. One sin. He misrepresented Christ just one time. His character was only 99.99% ready, not 100%. You see, Moses is a type of those of us who will have to die before Jesus comes back. We cannot be translated. We have to go through the grave. And so we have point number three. If you do not live for Jesus today, you will not remain alive when Jesus returns. Those without faith to overcome sin and without willingness to fight against self, which is the biggest enemy, of all, and those who misrepresent the character of Christ will have to die before entering the promised land. It is that simple. So how about the 144,000? Do they have a type? Is there someone in the history that has been filled with the Holy Spirit and was translated to heaven? Enoch. Who, sorry? Enoch. Enoch, Enoch is one of them who was translated, and one more. Elijah. Elijah was also filled with the Spirit. And sure enough, the Bible confirms this very plainly. If we um, look at Malachi 4, 4-5, it says there, Remember the law of Moses. So we have Moses as a type. Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. You see, Moses and Elijah throughout prophecy are symbols, are types, of God's end time people. Moses is who? The great multitude, those who will die believing in the third angel's message. And Elijah is the 144,000. He represents those who will remain alive and be translated directly to heaven. And here's a few examples in Luke 16, 31. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, who are the prophets, Elijah, they will not be convinced if someone rises from the dead. Isaiah 20, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Who is the law? Who gave the law? Moses. Who is, what's testimony? The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, the law and the prophecy. Moses and Elijah are repeatedly throughout prophecy represent God's end-time people. Think about this. Who came with Jesus when he was about to be crucified on the Mount of Transfiguration. Who came from heaven? Moses and Elijah. Is that an accident, do you think? Nothing is accidental in the Bible. Moses and Elijah represent those who will die for Jesus and those who will live for Jesus. And the spirit of prophecy in Desire of Ages confirms this. Elijah, who had been translated to heaven without seeing death, represents those who will be living upon the earth at Christ's second coming, and who will be changed in a moment in a twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. And she goes on, prophecy must be fulfilled. Somebody is to come, future, somebody is to come in the spirit and power of Elijah. And when he appears, men will say, you are too earnest. 
you do not interpret the scripture in the proper way. You're too zealous. Let me tell you how you should teach your message. This is what she says. Who will tell Elijah how to preach his message, brothers and sisters? Jesus. It is the Jesus movement. And who is the end time Elijah? Is it a single prophet? Is it one person? No. Those who prepare the way for the second coming of Christ are represented by the faithful Elijah. And if that wasn't clear, she adds, the hour of God's judgment has come and upon the members of His church on earth rests the solemn responsibility of giving warning to those standing, as it were, on the brink of eternal ruin. And here we come to point number four. The Elijah movement is not one individual. It is the 144,000 special group of God's remnant end time people led by Jesus to close the gospel in the spirit and power of Elijah. So why are the 144,000 so special? Let us have a look at this a little bit more detail. Because I for one would rather be in those who are alive than those who have to die. I don't know about you, but I guess that's a decision you need to make. We can read in Revelation 7, 1 to 5, um, a little bit more about this special group. It says, After these things I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea of the trees, till we have sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000. Alright, so what is special about the 144,000? They are sealed during their lifetime. Are we all sealed? Yes. We are all sealed, but when are we sealed? We know that heaven records all of our actions throughout our lives. They have books and we don't believe that once you're saved, you're always saved, right? We believe that you can go astray from God, you can come back. So the life is a constant uh, walk with God. But when you die, your record is finalized. The books no longer have any more actions in them, they're sealed. And uh, you then wait for the day of redemption. So the sealing is a finalization of the record. Now the 144,000, they have a special sealing. They are sealed when? Yeah. During their lifetime. It may even be now. So they're sealed during their lifetime. Uh, and this is very unique because their record of their actions is finalized and whether they're saved or not, before they die, before death. So they have to live past the close of probation. They have to live uh, before a holy God without a mediator, without Jesus being in the sanctuary. So they need to, right now, today, overcome sin and self through Jesus and receive the fullness of the latter rain. Okay? You know the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the 144,000? Well, when the early church started being persecuted, the people were still given the Holy Spirit. There was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. That was the early rain. But in the end times, it says the closing of the gospel will be even with greater power. That means the people of God will need to empty themselves even more so they can receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit and be sealed during their lifetime. <coughs> Why are they so specially singled out, says the spirit of prophecy? Because they had to stand with the wonderful truth right before the whole world and receive their opposition. And while receiving this opposition, they were to remember that they were the sons and daughters of God and that they must have Christ born within them for the hope of glory. Come back to that stadium that we talked about. Imagine now you're in Etihad Stadium, 50,000 people are there, they are all of the same opinion, but you are the one person in between and you are telling them a different thing. You're witnessing for God in front of 50,000 people. That is the job and the task of the 144,000. They are the closing argument in the great controversy. They are sealed before the time of trouble. They preach the three angels' message to the whole world. They give the final warning to the world. They are the final witness to the world. They are the final example 
the final example of what Christ's people should be like before probation closes. They endure the anguish of the time of trouble, and as we said, they stand without an intercessor. And how can they do all this? How is it possible? Because they have a Jesus character. They have the Father's name on their foreheads, which means that they have the Father's character in the last days. You know, I can use my own word, but really the Spirit of Prophecy describes it very well. But then I looked and behold, the Lamb standing on Mount Zion, and we think the 144,000 having His Father's name written on their foreheads. These are the ones, I apologize, this is actually the Bible, so Revelation 14, 1 to 5. These are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to go into the Lamb, and in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. But these people follow Jesus wherever He goes. They do it in heaven. Every time, when, when Alan G. White has a vision, the 144,000 are always next to Jesus, around Jesus, and then everybody else around them. So they are the Jesus entourage, if you will. And it is not a small thing to be close to Jesus. In one place, the Spirit of Prophecy says that the very definition of heaven is to be close to Jesus. Amen. They have the victory. We see here that they have no deceit. They have no fault. They have removed sin, removed themselves, and Christ has come in. They are not defiled with women. What does this mean? Are they really virgins? What are women in uh, the prophecy a symbol of? False churches, false institutions, false doctrine. They are not deceived by every wind of doctrine and apostate things that are currently sweeping our world and will be even more so as we get near the end. And here the Spirit of Prophecy says, the 144,000 bore the signet of heaven. They reflected the image of God. They were full of the light and glory of the Holy One. If we would have an image and superscription of God upon us, we must do what? Separate ourselves from all iniquity. We must forsake every evil way. And then we must trust our cases in the hands of Christ. While we are working our own salvation, working out our own salvation with fear and trembling, God will work in us to will and to do of His own good pleasure. We must not follow our selfish inclinations. We are to deny ourselves, take up the cross, and follow who? Jesus. We are to do our very best to sever ourselves from everything that is an offense to God. Sin is an offense to God. Such is the character of those who would be among the 144,000. And here we come to point number five. If we are saying that Jesus is going to come in our lifetime, those who would be part of the 144,000 must be sealed while they're still alive. They must forsake all iniquity and refine their characters now to enable them to stand before God in opposition to the whole world or opposed by the whole world through the time of trouble. And this seems very hard and a lot of work, but there is also a very special reward. There's a very special honor, and I want to really highlight this for you as we bring this to a close. A very special honor of the rewards and the privileges that the 144,000 have. They are set apart. They have a special experience which no one else has, no other company has ever had. And if you think about Moses, his experience, how many years are we since Moses? What, 4,000 years or something? For 4,000 years we're still talking about Moses and his experience in churches. So his story and his experience with God is being witnessed to the whole world. Imagine then the 144,000 who are going to have a special experience like no other. How long are we going to talk about their experience throughout eternity to the whole universe? The 144,000 travel, and the Spirit of Prophecy says this, God takes them from place to place in the universe and they share their experience. And not only that, but they are also glorified and vindicated on this earth. Have a, have a listen to this in the Spirit of Prophecy. I decree went forth to slay the saints, which caused them to cry day and night for deliverance. This was the time of Jacob's trouble, when all the saints cried out with anguish and spirit, 
and were delivered by the voice of God. The 144 tribe praised God. Their faces were lighted up with the glory of God. While the cloud was passing from the holiest to the east, which took a number of days, the synagogue of Satan worshipped at the saints' feet. Did you catch this? One, on earth, when God calls an end, the 144,000 are glorified. Their faces shine like Moses. Not only that, it takes a number of days between that and when Jesus actually comes. He says he's traveling some time. It says here when he's passing from the holiest to the east. And until that time, what's going to be happening? The synagogue of Satan is worshipping at the saints' feet. Who is the synagogue of Satan? It's the false religion, the false apostate religion which is going to be in the world at the time. One world religion. They will be worshipping at the saints' feet. They will recognize that God is with them and that they were right. They are vindicated before the wicked. And uh, we, we have many such confirmations in the Bible as well. For example, in Zechariah where it says, Thus says the Lord of hosts in those days, Ten men from every language and nation shall grab the sleeve of a Jewish man, saying, Let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. The 144,000 will be glorified before the earth. And they will also proclaim a wonderful truth. Are we to ever preach to others a date when Jesus is going to come back? Should we do that? No. But listen to this. Then we heard the voice of God. This is after the deliverance. After God has closed the great controversy. He has, re he has delivered his people from the wicked. He says, Then we heard the voice of God, which shook the heavens and the earth, and gave the 144,000 the day and the hour of Jesus' coming. Amen. They have a special truth. Before Jesus actually comes, they are told the day and the hour. This is after probation is closed, so it, it doesn't matter for anyone else. But it, it really makes us to understand that verse in Amos that says, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless He reveals His secrets to who? To His servants, the prophets, Elijah the prophet. Not only that, but we will be priests and rulers. Um, just going quickly through this uh, vision that uh, the Spirit of Prophecy has. Mount Zion was just before us, and on the mount was a glorious temple in heaven. This is the heavenly temple. There were all kinds of trees around the temple to beautify the place. Uh, they made the place glorious. And as we were about to enter the holy temple, Jesus raised his lovely voice and said, Only the 144,000 enter this place. Only the 144,000 can go into the temple of God in heaven. Did you catch that? Jesus says, To him who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. It is a great privilege and an honor to be in the temple. And what are they going to do there? She goes on to say, This temple was supported by seven pillars, all over transparent gold, set with pearls, most glorious. The wonderful things I there saw, I cannot describe. Oh, that I can talk in the language of Canaan. Then could I tell a little of the glory of the better world. I saw their tables of stone, which the names of the who, 144,000 were engraved in letters of gold. Tables with names on them. What's this? Why are there tables with names in the temple of God? What does it remind you of? A table with a name on it. I'll help you out. Work. It's a workplace. Judgment seat, maybe. Who puts name tags on, the, on, 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 a, on a desk with a, a seat behind it? Judges do. And Revelation 24 says rightly, And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. The 144,000 become judges. They vindicate the plan of salvation, because everything has already been done except they need to verify that God's judgments were correct. They vindicate God and they verify the judgments of the wicked. Uh, and it goes on to say that they shall be priests of God in Revelation and Christ and shall reign with Him a thousand years. And He has made us kings and priests. What is a king? What does a king have? Authority. A kingdom. Authority. 
So if it says that we will be kings, we will be rulers, there are tables there, the 144,000, God must let them rule in His kingdom. They are involved in the government of the universe. Okay? And now these words of Jesus make real sense in Matthew 24. What does He say? Who then is a faithful and wise servant, who his master made ruler over his household, to give them food in due season? Blessed is the servant who his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him what? Ruler over all his goods. The 144,000 will have the privilege of being rulers with God over the whole universe, over all his goods, if we are to take Jesus at his word. So I ask you, brothers and sisters, what is it that you are striving for? Are you a faithful and wise servant? Striving to be among the 144,000? Diamonds. I really like this picture that I found. I was lucky to find it. Diamonds and coal. Um, both are made of the same material, did you know? Carbon. But what is the difference? Diamonds are formed under high temperature and pressure over a long period of time. And because of this, they have superlative physical qualities. What does that mean? Of the highest quality or degree. They are rare and they are very high quality and they are beautiful as a result. It is the hardest known material, natural material. And the hardness, and this is really cool, the hardness depends on the purity. The purer and more flawless the diamond is, the harder it is. Coal. Um, um, what it's made from the same material, but how is it formed? From a long period of time as well, but a long period of decay and death in the Earth's, Earth's crust. Do you see where I'm going with this? What do we want to be? Do we want to be precious stones, or do we want to be fuel for the fire? Do we want to be black and thrown into the fire? Brothers and sisters, here is what the Spirit of Prophecy tells us. The Lord will use humble men who were sinners before to do a great and good work if they would let themselves transform their character. Through them, He will represent to the world the ineffaceable characteristics. These are the unforgettable, the unforgettable characteristics of the divine nature. Humble men will show the world the divine nature of God. And they will be like diamonds. And if you don't believe me, they will literally be like diamonds. Here it says, in the spirit of prophecy, great controversy, the voice of God is heard from heaven, declaring the day and the hour of Jesus' coming and delivering the everlasting covenant to His people. Like peals of loudest thunder, His words roll through the earth. The Israel of God stand listening, with their eyes fixed upward. Their countenances are lighted up with His glory and shine as did the face of Moses. And in Daniel as well, those who are wise shall what? Shine like the brightness of the firmament and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. And again in Zechariah, the Lord their God will save them in that day as the flock of His people for they shall be like what? Jewels of a crown. They will actually be diamonds lifted like a banner over His land. They shall be mine, says the Lord in Malachi. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on that day that I make them my jewels. Remember the priest in the Old Testament? What did he have on his breastplate? Twelve what? Stones. Twelve precious stones. What do you think they represent? The 144,000 as well. God keeps the 144,000 close to Him. They are precious to Him. They are right on his breastplate, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Then you shall again discern between the righteous and the wicked, between the coal and the diamonds. Then you will discern between the one who serves God and the one who does not serve him. Brothers and sisters, the question is, are we looking to be the coal or the diamonds? 
Do we want to be a precious jewel in the hand of Jesus? Or do we want to be charcoal for the fire? That is the question we need to answer for ourselves. And I will encourage us with a couple of words. And I know that some of us will die before Jesus comes. And some of us may live when Jesus comes. So I have two encouragements to leave you with. For those who might die before Jesus comes, you still have to do this work. You, 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 work. you still have to give your life to Jesus and live righteously. But it says there in the Three Angels message, it says, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and the work follow them, works follow them. So that is the encouragement for those of us who will be like Moses. But for those of us who will be like Elijah, there is an encouragement given to us in Psalms 91. And I have to read this as the final words to you. It's Psalms 91, verse 4 to verse 9. And it says like this. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. The truth, the tr his truth shall be a shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays place at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. One out of fifty thousand may fall, but they shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked, because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil shall be for you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling, for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in their hands that shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. May God help us to be among these two groups and fulfill our mission on earth. Amen. Amen. Amen.